Have you ever heard of Alexander of Abonotychus? No? Then you're missing out on a man who combined a puppet and a pet snake into a god he just made up. Who claimed to have solved the plague whilst actually making things worse. Who managed to fool Roman senators into believing he slept with a goddess. And even conned the famous Stoic Roman Emperor, Marcus Aurelius, into throwing some lines into a river. I can't decide if that last bit makes more or less sense when there's no context. We'll put some context on it in a bit. I'm definitely not exaggerating when I say he has to go down as one of the most interesting men in history. How many other people can claim to have turned some old bits of cloth and their pet into a deity that had hundreds of thousands of believers? Aside from Grumpy Cat, of course. And Ceiling Cat. And Elongated Cat. Hang on. Did Ancient Egypt play the long game? And we're now a bunch of cat-worshipping polytheists, as they had planned all along. That's a rabbit hole I'm refusing to go down. Pretty sure there's an alien conspiracy that's sitting at the bottom of it, and I'm told those guys don't believe in soap. A quick word of warning about Alexander of Abonotychus, not conspiracy theorists. Whilst we have archaeological evidence, for the most part, the only written evidence we have on him as a character is from one source, the Roman satirist Lucian, who is worthy of his own video at some point. Lucian did not like Alexander. There's a link to a free online translation of his piece in the video description below. It is well worth a read and will allow you to judge the quality of the source for yourself. Alexander of Abonotychus has that distinctly classical era problem of reporting on his childhood whilst using modern morals. He was born of fairly humble origins in the 2nd century CE, which he later retcons harder than the Disney-owned Star Wars universe. He made his way in the world as a boy by having some... <clears throat> gentleman friends? Yes, that is as it sounds. He was, by all accounts, a good-looking child, making him a very popular boy. I hate myself for having to write that. But one who, even back in childhood, had a genius mind that was sent more to Lex Luthor than Stephen Hawking. Lucian suggests that even Pythagoras would look like a child next to Alexander's intellect. One of his patrons, for want of a better word, was a con artist who worked as a quack healer, a magician, a peddler of treasure maps, and more. Alexander was a fast learner and quickly learnt the art of conning people for all they're worth. Eventually this man died and Alexander wasn't getting any prettier, so he decided to take over the business. But Alexander wanted to move the business forward. Like a catapulted cow carcass, he wanted to raise the stakes. He quickly formed a partnership with a writer of bad choral music, Coconas, which means nut, very apt. Alexander and the nut saw how much money the Oracle of Delphi were making and wanted a piece of the pie. You know who has a lot of money? The gods? Yep. What if we had our own god? You see, when a mummy sock and a daddy snake love each other anyway, that's how gods are born. So they invented a pet god. Well, I say invented a god. They took the Greek god of healing and medicine, Asclepius, and decided that he needed to be reborn as a Voldemort pet. After a quick argument about where to put this new oracle, they agreed on Alexander's home of Abonotychus, because he had first-hand experience of how easy they were to con out of their money and clothes. But how does somebody introduce a supposedly reborn Greek god into the world? Firstly, it's time to do some arts and crafts. They couldn't just use a blue screen to add a god in, and not just because of some stupid argument about whether the Greeks could see the colour blue. That is genuinely an argument some people have made. It's because everybody knows that colours weren't invented until the 19th century. Alexander made a human head out of linen, wood and horsehair, and a few other bits and pieces. History is oddly silent on whether underwear was involved, so I'm choosing to believe it was. He then bought himself, in the word of Lucian, a very fine snake. How does one judge how fine a snake is anyway? Wait, is there such a thing as a snake beauty contest these days? There's not. Now that's a business idea somebody needs to take on Shark Tank. But apparently in the 2nd century, Pella was famous for its tame, handsome snakes that, to quote Lucian, took milk from the breast just like babies, which seems impractical and would qualify wet nurses for hazard pay. Might explain why Hera put the snakes in Hercules' crib though. Maybe she was just caring for all the babies. She's no speciesist. Alexander popped over to Chalcedon, which is in modern-day Turkey, and hid some bronze tablets in the Temple of Apollo, the father of Asclepius, declaring that the god would be born in Abonotychus. Reports that Apollo was unhappy about having to give his son two birthday parties a year have been unable to be verified. Incidentally, Chaseledon was a place of a very important meeting in the history of the Christian church, where they argued and eventually split over... Um, hang on, I've got this somewhere how godly Jesus was. So apparently it's a place to go to discuss the divinity of a fictitious god. Anyway... With that done, he nipped back to Abonotychus, as if he had never gone away, and waited, whilst the nut stayed in Chaseledon writing prophecies. That didn't last long, because... Uh, 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 he died of a snake bite. Such delicious irony. But the tablets that Alexander had buried were soon found, and suddenly the news was everywhere. Abonotychus, proving Alexander right when he declared them a bunch of gullible idiots, voted to make a temple to the new god. 
Tablets didn't just declare a divine rebirth though, they also declared a new prophet. This says, And the prophet who will profit from your payment of my prophecies will be Alexander, descendant of Perseus. I never imagined a snake god getting on with the letter P, but there we go. Let's take a moment to appreciate the level of lie that Alexander was pulling off. He managed to convince people who have known him since his birth to humble parents that he was the kin of a genuine Greek hero of myth that he was heir to the slayer of the snakehead Gorgon Medusa, and that he was returning as a prophet to a reborn snake god, son of Apollo. Is someone coming? Maybe it's someone selling magic stuff. It's just Alexander. I'm back, as the prophet of a snake god. Hold up a minute, that's awesome. And I'm related to Perseus, slayer of snake demigods. Now, hang on, we know your mum and- Hail Alexander, scion of Perseus. But what about the birth of the gods? That was pretty easy for him to pull off. He simply got a baby snake, which are apparently called sneglets, like a piglet, just less legs, and you can't shave off its wool to make bacon, and hid it inside a goose egg. He then put the goose egg in some standing water in the foundations of the new temple. The next day, he made a big song and dance about praying to the new god, which he called Glycan, and being directed to find the snake. It attracted an awful lot of people, proving, yet again, my theory that religion was just an historical Netflix. Taking it out of its watery hiding spot, he declared it the divine glycon, and legged it back home before anyone could get a proper look at the snakelet, or try shave it to make bacon. I think I may need to read up on how food is made. He waited a few days, hiding away in his home, apparently nobody thought to check there, before emerging to declare that Glycon was now fully grown in his slithering majesty. He had people ushered through a dimly lit room, with him holding his pet snake, not a euphemism, his head hidden behind his back, and the linen human head he had constructed held carefully under his arm, as if part of the snake, with his beard and hair intentionally obscuring parts of it. This, he told everyone, was the god. With dim lighting and only a quick movement through the room, no one argued. Well, Christians and Epicureans did, but they were met with threats to stone him by the followers of Glycon. The irony being that the followers of Glycon were using Christian teachings. Did Jesus not say, For he who eats a first stone, follow it with many more, a f ye, do so until you have turned thy enemies into a pile of blood and bones under a mountain of pebbles? If yours doesn't, you need a better Bible. So people believed him. They started flocking him from miles away, places such as Thrace and Galatia, to see Glycon for themselves. So when Alexander declared that Glycon would soon be making prophecies, they were excited as a dog when you accidentally rustle its lead. Once the temple was fully built, he got people to write down the questions to the god and seal them in a scroll. If you're wondering why no one ever tried a gotcha-style question, they did. Lucian tried it and ended up with him being nearly killed by a mob, and eventually stranded in the middle of nowhere after a ship's captain decided he didn't want murder on his immortal soul. Seals were about as easy to pull off as divine births, it seems, so he was able to read the scrolls and reseal them without the author being any the wiser. He would then give the scroll back a few days later, for a fee of course, and hand a tailored prophecy over with it. The fee was a drachma and two obols, there were six obols to a drachma, and the average day wage of a labourer was about two obols. In his best year, Alexander brought in over 80,000 drachma via the oracle. Quite the step up from hawking some fake medical potions, I'm pretty sure the modern self-help industry is getting its cue cards from Alexander. But he wasn't done with conning people based on their health. Like a tech company in Silicon Valley, he just had to find a big enough problem he could pretend he solved. He hired people to spread the word of the oracle around the Roman Empire, and when the Antonine Plague struck in 165, he sent the message that he could help. He gave people a message to write above their door to ward away the plague, which was likely either measles or smallpox, neither of which had diseases that had been known to read. Lucian attests that not only did the wards not work, but those people that used them were more susceptible. Reason it was probably because it became overconfident and failed to take other precautions. Now, I'm not saying we can draw parallels between this con man's actions and politicians' actions in present day pandemics, but uh, actually, yes. Yes, I am. Despite being responsible for the death of thousands in a plague, his missionaries into Rome itself paid off. He came to the attention of a powerful, pious figure in the form of the Council Rutilianus, who was later to become the Proconsul of Asia. Never a man to fail to pay devotion to the gods, he was excited about the idea of a living, breathing god in a Bonaticus, and immediately sent out messages with questions for the oracle. Soon, he was a fully-fledged convert, and started singing the praises of Alexander and Glycon to the other Roman senators. With a now rich and powerful audience, Alexander decided the game needed up and even further. But how does one top make it up an entire god, building a temple, and issuing fake prophecies? To that end, he created a speaking tube through the mouthpiece of the head he had created, allowing someone to speak prophecies rather than deliver them in writing, wowing the audience yet further. This was reserved purely for the rich and powerful. The 1%. The powerful and rich also had a nasty surprise option available to them, hidden deep in the T's and C's that no one ever bothers reading. Apparently, if Alexander opened the scroll and it had some secrets we were asking Glycon about, then Alexander would use that to blackmail them. Oh great Glycon, how do I kill the Emperor and steal the Imperial Purple for myself? Listen close, my child, for this is important. There will be ten drachma a month if you don't want me to tell the Emperor about this. 
Remember at the start when I said he had some unsavoury relations with adults when he was a kid? Well, now he was an adult, and it was his turn to be the evil one. I know. I know. We shouldn't judge history by the morals of today, but I'm sticking to my guns on this being evil. In what would later become the Catholic Church's playbook, he would ship choir boys in for a few years, and after he was done, ship them out again. Yeah, uh, by modern standards, he is utterly evil. But, in his defence, by the standards of the time, he was also evil. Unfortunately, it was just for different reasons. But don't think it was just choir boys. He was also openly sleeping with married women, something that many husbands were oddly happy about, even proudly stating that the child their pregnant wives were carrying was the offspring of Alexander. It takes all sorts, I suppose? One of his illegitimate children stood out from the rest, though, thanks to Alexander's repurposing of religion and history yet again. Alexander's retcon game was hitting heights that would be unsurpassed until the dawn of superhero comics. He claimed that he was asleep when he was observed from afar by Selene, the Greek goddess of the moon, who fell instantly in love with him. She came down to earth and had her way with him whilst he slept. Soon after, she gave birth to his daughter. You see, when a moon goddess loves an unconscious man very much... Anyway, that's how demigods are made. After he managed to convince everyone that his daughter was indeed a demigod, he made a prophecy, telling the powerful Roman politician mentioned earlier, Rutilianus, that he was to marry her. Never mind that Rutilianus was in his sixties and Alexander's daughter was far younger. He was marrying a demigod, goddammit, and he wasn't going to let ages and stop him. With a powerful ally in Rome, and many other senators besides, it wouldn't have been a huge shock that the famous Stoic emperor, Marcus Aurelius, yes, of gladiator fame, asked Lycan how he should ensure the god favour in battle with the Germanic tribes. The solution Alexander gave? Throw two lines into the River Danube. Perfectly logical. And it went very well for the Germanic tribes. The lions got out the river and charged at the standing German army on the other side. Not having seen the lion before, they just thought them large dogs and killed them quickly. The battle was just as quick, Lucian saying that 20,000 Romans were killed. So Alexander quickly used the same cop-out answer that the oracle at Delphi once used and claimed he never said which side would benefit. Oddly, that didn't end his political power. Far from it. At his request, coins were minted showing glycan on the reverse, and, deciding the name of Bonatikus was too hard to say, he changed it to, oh god, that's not any bloody better, mate, Ionopletion? Ionopletion? Ionopoliton? I wanna wanna wanna? Ionopolitan? Ionopolition? I... oh, never mind. It hardly matters. With all that done, does this con end badly for our legendary evil genius? Nope. He died aged 70, after an infection to his leg. But what of the Church of Glycon? There was some power struggle to decide who the next holder of the sock puppet snake would be, before Rutilianus took charge and said he would hold the role open until Alexander was born again, whereby it quickly falls out of the historical record. Not that Alexander would have cared, he got what he wanted, power, money, women, and gullible people believe in his lies. Truly an ancient con man for more modern times.